<coughs> Excuse me. All right, this morning we're looking at, um, I think I've already mentioned, a passage that Stephen Nichols uses uh, basically at the end of his um, um, lecture this evening on Ulrich Zwingli and the rediscovery of grace to remind us of, of how Jesus preached grace. So this is one of his most gracious calls. And I think the context in which he issues it is very much like that of Luther and Zwingli's day when the church had essentially told everyone, and we're going to see more about this this morning, that you have to work by the grace of God with his help. You have to work yourself into a state or into a condition where you're essentially like Jesus. And once, once you are good enough, then God will declare you to be righteous. Well, that's exactly what the, the, the Jews were being taught by the Pharisees, right? Keep the law and you'll be pleasing to God. Well, it does please the Lord, of course, when we keep the law, but only when you keep it with the right motive. And that is to thank Him for the mercy He has shown you in the Lord Jesus Christ. We have to put grace first. Salvation comes first. And then through a changed heart, we live the way the Lord calls us to live. And we don't live in order to work our way into heaven. We're already saved. Now we work because we love the Lord and we're thankful. So that's what we want to look at this morning. And this call that Jesus issues to the Jews, again, comes in the same context as the days of Luther and Zwingli. And we're going to see a bit of that in, uh, in the sermon this morning. So this, first of all, let's read the call Jesus gives to the Jews in Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30. Very familiar one. We've heard it many times. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And we're going to see exactly why it's so easy and why it's so light. It has to do with God's grace. Now, as we're Making our way through the five solas of the Reformation, we're reminded why the Reformation matters and why every year during this time, during the month of October, in this case we're splashing a little bit from September all the way into November because we have, I think it's six lectures all together, uh, we're learning, or again, we're, we're being reminded of why the Reformation matters because this is basically the gospel, the rediscovery of the gospel. It was essentially lost but it was found again through a study of the Scripture. Again, it was during this time the Lord revealed these things to His church. Now, Rome perhaps, well, not necessarily on purpose, we don't know. Perhaps it was on purpose, but Rome had hidden the truth. And it was hidden, as we saw, in a variety of ways, but primarily through a translation of the Bible called the Latin Vulgate. It was translated by Jerome, I believe, in the 4th century. When he was translating it, he used a phrase when Jesus says in the Gospel of uh, Mark, and he says it in other places as well, the time is fulfilled, you know, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, repent and believe the Gospel. Uh, Jerome used a Latin phrase to translate that, that word, translated repent, uh, that could mean in the Latin either repent or do penance. And Rome went with the second and buried the gospel in works. There's a big difference between repenting and doing penance. In the one case, you're turning away from your sins. In the other case, you are doing works to try to satisfy for the wrong things that you've done. Now, as we saw, Rome also compounded the problem by adding other sources of truth that buried the gospel, what they believed to be the traditions of, of the early church. You know, they believed that the, the church essentially preserved it in what they were doing and what the church was doing through the Middle Ages, through the, um, well, through the ancient church as well, that these traditions were established by the apostles and so they had divine authority. And so they included that in their authoritative system of truth. They included what church councils had to say as they met on different occasions to discuss issues that affected the entire church, such as the meeting at Nicaea in 325 to discuss the Trinity 
or the Council of, of Chalcedon, where they discussed the two natures of Jesus Christ. They took all the councils that took place, the ecumenical councils, where the whole church met together. And they said, because the whole church is meeting together, God must be blessing this. Our conclusions, even if they are outside of the scriptures or adding to the scriptures, must be God's authoritative truth. And of course, they also added what the popes had to say. They believed the pope was because he was seated in the chair of Peter. You talk about uh, the, the proclamations they make, ex cathedra, which means from the chair of Peter, from the seat of this office of teaching. They believe that when a pope made proclamations from this office as a teacher with regard to uh, faith and morals, that what they said was absolutely authoritative and was God's word to them. Now, the Reformation was a return, as we've already seen, to the Bible alone as the authority. That is what sola scriptura is all about. Now, we're not saying that there weren't some good traditions that may have come out of the early church, but the only ones that have any authority are those that God requires in the Scripture. We have to see it there. The early church councils, we know, got some very important things right. They got the Trinity right. They got the two natures of Christ right. We still hold to those things today because they agree with the Scriptures. Now, Luther pointed out in his day with regard to the popes, that they were frequently saying things. One, you know, there wasn't, well, there were several popes, as you know, throughout the ages. But they were saying things that contradicted each other. Now, it's not, we're not saying they never said anything that was right. But the problem is it's not right unless it's consistent with Scripture. The pope does not have the right or the authority from the Lord to change his truth. The point is God alone tells us what is true. And the only way that he does is through the Bible. Remember, Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, all scripture, all sacred writing, which is, of course, he's talking about the Old Testament here. But as we know, in the New Testament, we see the different authors recognizing that others who were, who were writing in this time frame, who were written in the scriptures, also were writing scripture. All scripture is inspired by God. All these writings are breathed out by God, and they are profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. And the point for us today, of course, is if we want to know that what we are hearing, whether it be from a friend or a group of friends, whether it be from a high-profile Bible teacher, whether it be from the one who's standing here and, and preaching to you week by week, whether it be from a denomination or one of the many self-proclaimed prophets that rise up in this world, if we want to know whether these things are really what God says, we need to compare it with what He says in His Word because we know God does not contradict Himself. Now, remember what we saw last week as well, how important it is that we listen to what God says. Solomon represented wisdom or the word of God or the truth of God as a woman who cries out in the public spaces and the, uh, at the gates and at the roads as people are passing by and she says, listen to me. Listen to what I have to say. If you do, there's long life and riches in my hands. But if you don't listen to what I say, then I'm going to laugh when your calamity comes on you. We need to listen to what God has to say. Now today we begin to see how this return to Scripture worked itself out in the Reformation and how important it is. We're going to begin to look at the Gospel. When Luther studied the New Testament in Greek, uh, Don and I were talking about this this morning on the way here, we're going to see the same thing with Ulrich Zwingli. Zwingli actually worked with Erasmus on this Greek New Testament. And it was his study of this that led him to the truth, to the Gospel. Yeah, you know, we think about Martin Luther starting the Reformation with nailing the 95 Theses to the church door at, at, at Wittenberg. I think really what started the Reformation was Erasmus creating this, this text of the Greek New Testament because then those who studied it were able to discover the gospel. But we found out that when Luther studied it, he began to see what the gospel really was saying. Jesus was not telling us to do penance to prepare ourselves to enter into his eternal kingdom. 
He wasn't telling us that we need to confess our sins to a priest, that we need to do good things to make up for the wrong things we've done. We need to satisfy for our sins and that we need the priest to absolve us his word that our sins are forgiven in order to enter into heaven. What Jesus is telling us to do is repent, to turn from our sins and to look to Jesus for his forgiveness for his righteousness to make us acceptable to the Father so that we could enter into heaven by his grace. Now this morning, as I've said, we're going to consider the second sola, which is sola gratia, that we are saved by God's grace alone and not in any sense by the works that we do. Now for the reasons we've already seen, Rome had abandoned this truth. They had abandoned this principle and they had embraced works. Now, they believed in those days and they still believe today that we need God's grace in order to be saved. We can't be saved without God's involvement. If, If God had not sent his son into the world to live a life which they considered to be above and beyond, the call of duty because Jesus takes his merits and he puts them in the treasury of merits and those merits are beyond what he needed. If he hadn't sent his son to do this and to give his life on the cross, salvation for Rome would not be possible. They believe in God's grace, but not grace alone. Okay, That wasn't enough. We need more than that. Well, what do we need? Well, for one thing, we need uh, God's divinely instituted priesthood. We need priests to give us grace. And these priests can only be found in the Roman church. And they are able to do it through the sacraments. That's the difference between evangelicalism and what we call sacerdotalism, which would be, again, evangelicalism and the Roman Catholic and Greek Orthodox churches. We believe grace comes through the gospel, belief, right? They believe it comes through the sacraments. And you need a priest to put the grace into the sacraments so that you can be saved. So what what do they believe? What are the works the priest has to do? Well, they have to do several things. And we need these things from them. We need their baptism. That baptism gives us our first dose of grace so that we might enter into God's kingdom. You know, and they're thinking, if we had nothing else but, but baptism as, as an infant in the church, and we had never committed any mortal sins while we're in this world, we might have to spend a long time in purgatory, but we will eventually get to heaven because we got grace through the sacrament of baptism. But there's, there's more than just baptism. We also need the mass from them, which is somewhat of a counterpart to our Lord's Supper. We need to eat and to drink, in their view, the literal body and blood of Jesus, his actual physical blood and body, to nourish the grace that is in our souls through baptism. We need to be confirmed by them. When you reach a certain age and you know the catechism and you become a full-fledged member of the church, you're sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit by the priest making a sign of a cross on your forehead with the holy consecration oil. By the way, that's called chrism. If you've ever run into that in the Greek Orthodox Church, it's also in the Roman Catholic Church, chrism. And they believe they confer the Holy Spirit through this anointing oil and the sign of the cross. We need absolution when we sin. The declaration of the priest that we're forgiven. The priest needs to hear our confession. We need to go and confess our sins to them. They need to tell us what we need to do, okay? What works we need to do and how much of them we need to do in order to repair the damage that we have done through our sins. And we need their declaration, their absolution that our sins are forgiven because they believe when they make that declaration on earth, our sins are forgiven in heaven and that's how your sins are forgiven. Not by confessing them to Jesus and asking for his mercy, but confessing them to the priest and receiving his mercy. If we marry... We need more grace from the priest to live in that marriage for God's glory. 
When we get sick or we're dying, we need what they call extreme unction to be anointed by the priest with holy oil to give us more grace either to recover if we're sick or to reduce our time in purgatory if we happen to be dying. And if we're called into the ministry, we need holy orders, hands laid on us by the priest to give us more grace to do the work of a bishop, a priest, or a deacon, as well as to give us the ability to give God's grace to God's people through the sacraments. You cannot put grace in a sacrament unless you have hands laid on you by the priests. And of course, you can only do that if you're called to be a bishop or a priest. Now, the point behind all of this is simply this. Rome believes that if the priests don't do this work, we will not have the grace we need to be saved because we need that grace to be able to do the work we need to do in order to be saved by God. Okay, and that brings us to the second point. There is a work that we also have to do. We need to come to the priest for this grace to the sacraments so that we can work towards our justification. We need to come to the priest for absolution, confess our sins, do the work that he assigns us, and by the way, those works would be good works, acts of charity, maybe making restitution if we've stolen something from somebody, praying through the rosary. We need to earn indulgences. By the way, remember that Luther nailed the 95 Theses on the church door at Wittenberg because Tetzel was out there selling indulgences. Indulgences are basically, it's not, it's not forgiveness, you're not buying forgiveness when you buy an indulgence, but what you are buying is basically uh, satisfaction for the temporal punishments for your sins. The, the uh, penance that you would have to do in this world to make up for the wrong things that you've done, the good works and, and praying through the rosary and all those other types of things, making restitution. The indulgence takes care of that part of it. Jesus takes care of your guilt so you don't go to hell but you still have to make satisfaction. Well, Tetzel was going beyond that, remember? Tetzel was saying, buy this indulgence and all your sins will be forgiven. And Luther was reacting against that. Now, as I've said, we need to earn these indulgences because we can't buy them anymore. It's not that there's anybody, you know, nobody around to peddle them to us, but indulgences, the purchase of indulgences was outlawed in 1567 after the Council of Trent by Pope Pius V. You can't buy them anymore, that's abominable. But we can earn them. We can earn them by making charitable contributions. We can light candles and burn incense to the saints. We can pray for the dead. We can do good deeds and we can pray the rosary. You can't buy them, but you can work to earn them, okay? So here's more works. When we do these works, the treasury of the saints is open to us. The merits of Jesus and his saints are applied to us to shorten our time in purgatory. So two things Rome believes. We need to get grace from the priests so that we can work our way towards justification. And what they mean by that is this, so that we might so overcome our sins and become so much like Jesus that God looks at us and he says, you are good enough to enter into heaven. And you know, not too many people are. And the ones who do are the saints. And there's not that many saints in the Roman Catholic Church. So not too many enter into heaven when they die. They have to go to purgatory to make up the difference, perhaps for a thousand years, perhaps for a million years, perhaps for a billion years. But eventually, they will make it to heaven. Well, they didn't do enough work, you see, in order to go straight to heaven. So works are involved in the Roman Catholic system. And this is the backdrop of, of the Reformation, where the rediscovery of grace and the fact that we don't work our way into heaven, but God provides it for us freely. The Bible says all of us who have trusted in Jesus are actually saints, okay? Now, last week, we saw that Luther tried to find this peace with God, this forgiveness, the sense that I'm forgiven and I'm on my way to heaven through this system we just looked at. But he wasn't able to find it. Remember, the problem he saw was that it's not just the sins I've committed because I can deal with those things through the, these ways that, 
that Rome has given me, I can go to the priest and I can, I can do penance and I can receive absolution. But the problem is tomorrow I'm going to be back again because I have a bigger problem, and that is I have sin in my heart. And Rome can't take care of this issue. They don't have the solution to this problem, this evil that's in my heart. I need something more, Luther said, and he couldn't find it in Rome. So his confessor, remember, Staupitz, Johann von Staupitz, thought he would help him out. He sent him, first of all, to study theology, but that didn't help. He sent him to Rome on church business, hoping that by seeing Rome and all this glory and holiness and being able to uh, do the things that, that he might be able to do to gain the various indulgences he might gain there would bring comfort to his troubled soul. But remember, that didn't help either. Because when Luther was in Rome, he saw all the corruption that was going on. He saw the money mongering of the priests, you know, doing masses for money. He saw all the claims that were being made for the different acts of, of uh, obedience or of, um, you know, basically, you know, the things like going up the stairs and so forth. He saw the claims that were being made of, of how many thousands of years off you would get in purgatory if you would just simply do these things. And he realized there's no way you could prove that any of this was true. So as he gets to the top of the stairs, he basically says, who knows? Who knows if this is really true? So he didn't find peace at Rome either. And so Staupitz sent him to the University of Wittenberg to teach the Bible. And remember, it was there that Luther immersed himself in the study of God's Word. And when he got especially into the New Testament, he studied the Greek manuscripts. And he found the truth that we don't need to do all this work in order to be right with God. All we need is what God has already provided through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. When we were guilty under God's judgment and His enemies, He sent His Son to live for us and to die for us so that if we would just believe in Him, we would be justified through His obedience, through His death. When we were spiritually dead, that's the way we come into this world. When we were spiritually dead and, and completely unable to do anything to please God, even to receive the offer of His Son through Jesus, Jesus sent His Holy Spirit to make us alive so that we could believe in Him. And now we work. You know, Rome looks at us and, and they say, you don't think works are important anymore. You don't, you don't do any good works you know, we're full of good works. Look at all the works we're doing. Yes, well, if you think you're going to have to earn your salvation by works, you're going to be working pretty hard. But we still work. But our work now is not that we might be saved. The work we do is out of thankfulness that God has saved us through His Son. We believe that we are saved purely by His grace. Now, that's what Jesus is telling us in our passage. To those Jews who believed that they could only be justified by keeping the law, and remember how Jesus said on one occasion when he rebuked the Pharisees, he says, you lay a burden on the backs of those that you're teaching, but you won't even lift a finger to help them bear it. The Jews were under this heavy load. I have to do all these things if I'm going to enter into the kingdom of, of God eventually. Well, Jesus was speaking to those Jews that had that burden placed on their back, and he says in Matthew 11:28, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I'm going to take that burden off of you because I have borne it for you. I have done it through my own work. That's exactly what Luther discovered. You know, there were occasions where he'd go into his little monk cell and he would take a whip and he would whip himself for, for his sins, trying to, to placate God for the things that, uh, that he had done that were against his will, but he did not find that forgiveness. The Lord in the gospel said to him, come to me and I will give you rest. Now the Lord says the same thing to any of you here this morning. If you, like these Jews and like Luther, are trying to make yourself good enough for God to accept you, he says, come to me and I will give you rest. Because you need to realize if you're doing that, first of all, you're basically under the covenant of works. And everyone, Paul tells us, who tries to justify themselves before God 
through their works are under the curse because no one can keep the law. The fact is, if you try to make yourself acceptable to God through your obedience to his commandments, you will never, ever do it. Jesus tells you instead to come to him for his rest. In other words, for his life, the life that he gives. He says that if you come to him, he will forgive you, and he will give you the righteousness that you need to be acceptable by the Father. Now, Jesus goes on to say that he will also show you how to live. He will give you the, the, the model and the direction that you need in your life to live in a way that is pleasing to the Father, even as Jesus lived to please him. He says in verse 29, take my yoke upon you. You know, cast off the burden of trying to earn your own salvation. But then take my yoke on you. Become my disciple and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Again, instead of striving to make yourself acceptable to God, now you'll be serving the Lord out of thankfulness according to the pattern that Jesus gave us. Did Jesus ever look like he was agonizing, doing what it is the Father had given him to do? It wasn't difficult for him. Now, that's what he goes on to say in this last statement when he says he will also give you the power to do these things. He will give you a new power that you did not have before, and that is his Holy Spirit. He says in verse 30, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, what makes the yoke of Jesus easy for us to bear? Well, it's the fact that having changed your heart by his Holy Spirit, you now want to be like him. You now want to do what Jesus is calling you to do. You know, obedience is only difficult if you don't want to do it. If you want to do it, it's, it's really quite easy. It's your pleasure. It's your delight. So Jesus gives you the ability to do what he says. And so he takes the weight out of the yoke and he makes the burden light. You don't have to make yourself good enough for God to accept you. All you need is Jesus. So if you haven't taken him up on this offer, if you've never done that, do so now because Jesus again offers you his grace this morning if you're willing simply to trust him. And if you have already taken Jesus up on his offer, then remember as you prepare to come to the table that Jesus has done it all. Remember to thank him for his free gift of eternal life that cost him his life to give you. Well, let's, let's bow, shall we, for a few moments of prayer and let's ask the Lord to take what we've heard and apply it and particularly to give us the grace to trust in the work of Jesus alone to save us. And then afterwards, we'll, we'll spend just a couple of moments preparing to come to the table.